Good morning, everybody. I have a bunch of administrative stuff that I want to get through before we start on doing the fun stuff for today. So uh, last night I released the first homework assignment in this class. It's due uh, a week from this previous midnight. Uh, I want to share with you a bunch of administrative details that mostly pertain to homework in one way or another. So we have uh, this online discussion forum I told you about, Piazza. That's something that you have to sign up for yourself. Many of you I see are already on Piazza. If you're not, you go to the website, you say that you're a Cornell student taking CS4820, you enter some information, and you're online. Um, this is going to be my main uh, channel for communicating information to you in broadcast mode. Uh, so if I have an announcement that I want to make to the entire class, I will usually make that announcement by sending an instructor note on Piazza. Um, you also use it for asking questions. The questions can be about lectures, homework, anything else that you uh, want to bring up. They can be private or public. A private question will be seen by the instructors only. A public one will be seen by other students on Piazza as well. Uh, I I'm relying on you to use good judgment in deciding what to mark private or public. In particular, if you're asking a question that discloses uh, facts about the solution to one of the homework problems, that should clearly be marked private so that you don't divulge that information to uh, students who may not have figured out the solution yet. Uh, on the other hand, if you're asking a question to resolve a confusion that you think other people might be having, that's a good time to mark it public. Funny story from last spring. Uh, so I also use private instructor notes on Piazza to send uh, sketches of the homework solutions to the TAs. And uh, last spring, I forgot to set the flag that says this is private to instructors only. I posted it within... 45 seconds, I realized the mistake and set the flag back to private. Uh, but Piazza does this email digest thing where you can get like, you know, you can set it for every four hours or every 24 hours and it'll email you a summary of every note that was posted. And it turns out they have what I would describe as a bug, not a feature that whether something gets included in your email digest depends on whether the initial flag was public, not whether the flag at the time of sending out the email is public. So four hours later, everybody got the entire solution set in their email, and we had to just like cancel a homework assignment. Uh, so that's about Piazza. Uh, uh, the, the other main communication channel that pertains to homework is CMS. This is uh, something where we, the course staff, have to sign you up ourselves. Jenna Edwards, who's the course administrator, who uh, has been periodically scanning the enrollment list in this course and adding people onto CMS. In fact, I sent her an email this morning asking her to do one more such update. Uh, but if you go to, so to get to CMS, either you know the URL and you know where to go, or you go to the CS4820 website, it has a link. Um, when you go there, it'll show you all the courses that you're registered for. So if 4820 doesn't show up on that list, uh, then somebody has made a mistake and you need to write a private question to the instructors on Piazza asking, why am I not on CMS and can someone please add me? Um, okay, the first assignment. Uh, it's only three questions. Two are problems you have to solve. One is a piece of code you have to write in Java. Um, you'll see that the code is in the form of a 
partially written program that does some file I.O. for you so that everything gets loaded into memory. And then uh, you know, there are two consecutive lines with comments saying your code begins here and your code ends here. And in between those two lines, you insert the logic that actually runs the algorithm. Um, we've also provided you with some test instances so you can see if your code works. Uh, uh, the, you've taken other classes where you had to do coding, so you probably have a sense for like how long it takes you to write and debug a program. Uh, the homework problems in this class may take longer to solve than you are accustomed to for like math problem sets because um, I tend to ask questions that challenge you and call for creative thought in order to find the solution. Um, I don't assign a lot of problems that are just sort of, please go through this rote process that I taught you to verify that you know how to do it. Um, so for that reason, the number of questions on the problem sets is small, but the amount of time it takes you to solve them might be highly variable depending how efficient is your search process for creatively discovering math problem solutions. You're allowed to work in groups of one to four students. Uh, a group of more than one student can conduct this search in parallel, and so it tends to go faster. Uh, there is a public Piazza post called Find Homework Partners or something like that, which has already been initiated. And it sort of takes the form of a message board where if you are someone looking for partners, you can initiate a request as a sub-thread of that post, and other people can reply to it. So if you are in the position of uh, trying to find a homework partner, that's uh, uh, something that I hope you'll avail yourself of. Um, if you're working in a group on the homework, everybody is expected to write up the solutions in their own words. A good procedure for making sure that you're not plagiarizing each other is that if you've been working together on a whiteboard or uh, you know, a shared notepad, either physically or a shared online document, then at the moment that it's time for you to write up the solution you're going to turn in, um, it is probably a good idea to erase the whiteboard that you've all been looking at or put away the notebook and uh, just try writing what's in your mind. Uh, because otherwise there's a tendency to copy verbatim the same words that other people in your group are copying verbatim. Uh, and uh, you know, to turning in word for word identical paragraphs in your solution could be grounds for uh, being found to have violated academic integrity. Um, the other thing you should be careful of in terms of academic integrity is not using unauthorized sources to find answers to the problems that we assign. Um, one such unauthorized source is called Course Hero. I don't know how many of you are users of it, but it's basically crowdsourced cheating on uh, 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 college homework assignments. Um, and, uh, um, you know, downloading the answers to homework questions from that or any other source will be considered a violation of academic integrity. Um, some things that might strike you as being in a gray area or just fine, but don't strike me as being just fine, are um, using public legitimate looking sources to download stuff that you know is a solution to one of the homework problems. Let me give you an example. Uh, question three on this week's assignment says implement the Gale Shapley stable matching algorithm. Uh, never mind what that is, I'm teaching it to you later in this lecture. Uh, it's a very well known algorithm that's been around for more than 50 years. Uh, I'm sure there are many implementations of it on GitHub that you can just download and copy if you want. Um, 
These may look like a very public resource. It might even say, you know, an open source, you know, uh, Gail Shapley implementation for the good of everybody. Information should be free. Uh, but information should be free does not mean you should be free to uh, suck in open source information and use that to substitute for actually working on the assignment. Uh, okay, so that's my spiel about academic integrity. Uh, we have 30 TAs in this course, so there are going to be a lot of office hours. Those start Monday. Uh, there, we're running a, an algorithm to assign TAs to time slots, and the <coughs> deadline for TAs to enter their input to that algorithm was yesterday midnight. So over the weekend, we're going to be running the assignment algorithm and announcing the um, time slots and locations of everybody's office hours. Uh, if you're nervous that that information hasn't been announced, now you know why, but uh, that'll be rectified before the start of Monday. And finally, my favorite subject. Uh, the, in this uh, course, you have a budget of uh, so-called slip days for missing the deadline on homework assignments. This is a system that you may have seen in some of your other classes. I know that I'm not the only professor at Cornell who's using it. Uh, uh, these are charged in whole number increments, so if you miss the, if you turn in your assignment two minutes after the deadline, that will probably be within the grace period. Oh, I didn't tell you this. The deadline is 11.59 p.m. There's a random number of minutes between 0 and 30 constituting a grace period. It's, it's strictly greater than 0 and strictly less than 30. and I, I really am going to use a different number of minutes for the grace period every week so that you don't rely on how long the grace period is, but the grace period exists because I know how it is with time management. I'm the same way myself. If, if, you, know, you can feel absolutely certain that you are finishing this thing at exactly 11.59 and then you discover that you know, uh, your internet connection was slow or you just had to type the last words of that sentence, and suddenly it's 12.01, and I don't want to be a jerk. Um, but if I announced in advance how long the grace period is, you understand how that could lead to <laughs> exactly the same jerkiness, just delayed by 10 minutes. Uh, I don't think because I said the number 10 that that's the length of the grace period either. Okay, so slip days, right. It, it, say you turn in your assignment 45 minutes late. You're going to be charged one slip day, not 0 0.04 or whatever that is. Um, so if you exceed the deadline, you might as well exceed the deadline by close to 24 hours, because that's, that's how much additional time you now have. Um, the reason I give you slip days is because things happen to people in their life. Um, you are feeling sick and you just don't have the energy to finish the assignment. You were playing basketball and you sprained your wrist and it's really hard to write or type because that was your writing hand. Uh, your team is going on a trip starting from Wednesday morning to Friday morning and the homework is due Thursday night and you don't think that you're going to be able to finish it before you go on the trip. Uh, so you want to have a couple of days to turn it in after you get back. Okay? All of these are valid excuses for using slip days. Uh, slip days are offered to you on a no questions asked basis. So many of you will also use slip days for reasons like you didn't feel like doing it Thursday night and uh, there was something that looked more interesting so you're just going to take a slip day. Uh, uh, you plan to finish it on time, but you mismanaged your time, and now you're turning it in a day late. Um, that's also fine. You, you have six get-out-of-jail-free cards for when things like that happen. But it's your budget, and it's your job to handle the budget responsibly. So um, if I get Piazza questions during the semester, of the form, 
I sprained my wrist playing basketball, and now I can't uh, turn in the homework on time. Uh, please give me a deadline extension. I don't want to use my slip days because all my friends use their slip days for things like drinking or mismanaging their time. I'm, I'm not going to be very sympathetic to those requests because, uh, as I just explained to you, my belief is that the reason you have slip days is to plan for things <gasps> that could happen to you that would actually make it a hardship to finish the homework on time. Any questions? All righty. Um, we're now going to start on an actual algorithm. Uh, so this is for the so-called stable matching problem. It's section 1.1 of the book. And whereas uh, Wednesday's lecture was about puzzles to entice you uh, and illustrate to you the subtleties, uh, how subtle distinctions in a problem definition can uh, make the difference between computationally easy and computationally hard. Uh, uh, the reason we're introducing the stable matching problem is because this illustrates a genuinely useful problem that uh, is uh, subtle to solve algorithmically, but there are efficient algorithms to solve it, and they are used in the real world all the time on a, a regular basis um, to solve this matching problem. And the main application is... Uh, uh, employment, so matching workers to job positions. Um, unlike conventional job markets, which are decentralized, and it's basically firms compete with each other for hiring workers, and it's anything goes. There are no rules as to how this competition is structured. Uh, stable matching algorithms are used in centralized labor, labor markets where um, both the workers and the firms belong to a platform that aggregates information from both sides about their preferences and decides on matches in a centralized way. Uh, the first place that this was used in the real world was matching medical school graduates to residencies. So they replaced the old system of hospitals make offers to residents according to their own timeline and compete with each other and there's a lot of uncertainty about how the process plays out and a lot of secret backroom deals being made. That was replaced with um, the NRMP, the National Residency Matching Program, operates uh, an algorithm where every graduating med student enters their preferences, every hospital enters their preferences. Uh, and there's you know, like a single day when matches are made in a centralized way. Um, that works so well that it's now being adopted in many other places. The most recent upcoming application uh, is here at Cornell. We're going to start using this algorithm when uh, students apply to be undergraduate TAs for CS courses. Uh, So what does the input look like? Um, well, you have um, N applicants. You have N job positions, which I will henceforth referred to as employers, even though in many of the use cases, like the CS department one, there's actually 
one single employer that has more than one position to offer. Um, notice, by the way, that um, there's a simplifying assumption here. Uh, that the number of applicants is exactly equal to the number of uh, positions available. That simplifying assumption is being made for the sake of making this lecture clear and easy to follow, but it's not a limitation of the algorithm. In fact, uh, in the typical case where the number of job applicants is greater than the number of positions available, uh, it's easy to simulate uh, this ideal uh, equality situation in the realistic situation where applicants exceed job openings by just creating a bunch of dummy job positions that don't really exist but are just placeholders uh, representing unemployment so that you equalize the number of things on the two sides. Um, okay. Each applicant submits a ranking of the employers and uh, you know each employer submits a ranking of the applicants And the output is supposed to be a perfect matching of applicants to employers. Which means a set of ordered pairs each of which is an applicant I matched to an employer J. Uh, such that, uh, first of all, every party, applicant or employer, uh, belongs to uh, let me erase this and say it better uh, no two pairs have a member in common. Okay. That's called the matching property. And secondly, uh, every applicant and every employer belongs to one of the pairs.
I could have summarized this more succinctly by saying every applicant and every employer belongs to exactly one of the pairs. But I wanted to split it into two properties so that I could define matching as a term separate from perfect matching. Okay, so. Um, So that's what the output looks like. Uh, if that was the only specification of the problem, it would be totally trivial to solve this. You would just take applicant one, match it to employer one, applicant two matches to employer two. You wouldn't even have to look at the input data at all. Um, so what makes the problem interesting is that uh, We want to somehow output a good assignment of applicants to employers. And you know, there are many ways. If you were setting up an employment market, it's not clear how you would define the goodness property. Um, here are some alternatives that would make sense to me and probably other people, but that we're not going to address uh, in this algorithm. So one would be like, uh, you let every applicant designate a set of positions that they would want to take, and you assume that all the others are positions they don't want to take. So now, instead of having a complete any-to-any -any set of matching opportunities, um, you have something like, you know, maybe, uh, interesting. It could be that there's one job that everybody wants, and you know this person would also be satisfied with that job. Nobody wants the middle job. OK, and then you would try to output a set of pairs that matches as many applicants as you can, like maybe that set. This wouldn't be a perfect matching, but what can you do? Nobody wants the second job, so there's no way to compute a perfect matching on this data. Okay, That would be one way of potentially formulating the goodness goal. And then you would just try to maximize the number of matches. We'll actually talk about that later in the course. That's the maximum matching problem. It has a drawback that um, applicants who are very picky and say there's only one job in the world they could possibly be happy with tend to be more likely to get what they want than those who represent a larger list of options. So, I mean, you know, in this example, uh, it's potentially unfair that the bottom applicant got a job that, as far as we know, they, like everybody else, they might have preferred the top job, but because they were a nice guy or girl and said that the bottom one was also available, then they got stuck with it. OK. So, so there are potentially some fairness issues with this. Um, you can try to enhance the problem by saying something like, instead of just a yes, no, everybody specifies a number saying, how happy would you be if you got this job? And then we try to compute a perfect matching that maximizes the combined self-reported happiness of all the applicants. Uh, that takes care of one of the two problems with this formulation, which is that there might not exist a perfect matching. If you ask everybody to designate a happiness number on every job alternative, then at least you know there will be a perfect matching that you can find. Um, but it doesn't take care of the fairness concern at all. A, a greedy person 
will say, I'm 100% happy with this job and 0% happy with every other job, and they the, the, you know, maximize the total happiness criterion, will give those people a better chance of getting their top choice than people who are honest about their preferences. Um, OK, so this formulation and its generalization to maximum weight matching which, by the way, is also solved in Chapter 7. Have some issues with uh, unfairness and or dishonest reporting of preferences. Which means, by the way, that, that the great algorithms to use in a different environment where preferences don't really exist. Like if you just uh, say you're running a cloud computing platform and you have jobs and you have servers that can run the jobs and you just want to find a good assignment of jobs to servers. That is a problem that could be very well formulated as a maximum weight matching because these jobs are not personified entities that have feelings that could be hurt or preferences that you could want to satisfy. So fairness is not really a consideration. You know, unless it's a shared cloud that the jobs are actually owned by competing parties who each want their job to run first or something. But you know, let's say this, this is just Facebook scheduling, logging jobs that need to be done on different servers. Okay, so the jobs don't have preferences. There's no issue of fairness. You just want to sort of assign a score, a goodness score for every possible assignment and then compute a maximum weight thing. Okay. Um, environment like this with preferences, you want a different goal. And uh, Gale and Shapley, who are two economists, uh, formulated a different and very nice objective uh, for matching in two-sided markets with preferences. Uh, Shapley, by the way, won the Nobel Prize for this work. Gale presumably would have won the Nobel Prize, but died before the prize was awarded. Uh, what does the stability objective say? Um, in the perfect matching, that we output, There should not exist um, two pairs i j and i prime j prime. such that i prefers j prime to j while j prime prefers i to i prime. The reasoning was that if you have any two such pairs, that constitutes an unstable situation where um, Although the centralized matchmaker said, hey, I, I'm matching you to job J, and I'm prime, I'm matching you to job J prime, out of band after that assignment has been announced, uh, 
it could potentially happen that I approaches J prime and says, you know, I'd actually rather work for you. And J prime says, yeah, I would rather have you than the person that was assigned to me by the centralized system. And then the whole market will unravel because they'll just, uh, you know, out of band match with each other, leaving J without an employee and I prime without an employer. Um, this seems like a good time to bring up that I got an email last night from one of the previously 31 4820 TAs uh, saying that it turns out Steve Marshner needs an extra TA and could that person please uh, join Marshner's staff and leave 4820, which was actually fine with me, by the way. I think it, um, uh, we have lots of TAs for 4820, and I'm not too worried about losing one, and I'm happy that Professor Marshner has another TA, but that's just to indicate that this is not a mere hypothetical, these sorts of things. Ha these, these markets unravel all the time, and this is one of the reasons that the CS department might be looking forward to adopting a stable matching algorithm. Um, are there any questions about the stability property? Um, let me do two illustrative examples in a market with just two parties on each side. Um, okay, so in this first example, um, we'll have A, B, X, and Y. And the preferences look like this. Everybody agrees that X is better than Y. And furthermore, everybody agrees that A is better than B. In this situation, there is a unique perfect matching that's stable. Can someone tell me what it is? XA and BY. Okay, and the, the reason I know that this is the unique stable matching is that if you don't match A and X with each other, each one is the other one's top choice in all the world. Okay, so if they don't get matched with each other, then you definitely have the instability situation depicted in the diagram above. Uh, so you have to match A and X with each other. Once you do that, you're committed to match B with Y. Let's do another example. We have C and D, we have W and Z. And this time it's more interesting. C would rather have W than Z, uh, whereas D would rather have Z than W. W would rather have D than C, and Z would rather have C than D. Um, okay. This has the makings of a Russian novel or something like that. Do, do you see the irony here? C and D can both agree that the matching they would be happiest with is to be partnered with W and Z, respectively. And uh, W and Z can agree with each other that the matching they would be happiest with is to be partnered in the crisscrossing configuration, W with D and Z with C. So there's a matching that makes C and D perfectly happy because they both got their top choice. There's a different matching that makes W and Z perfectly happy, but there's nothing that satisfies both of them simultaneously. And in this case, uh, both of those matchings are stable. For example, if you do the red matching, 
C and W don't constitute an unstable pair because W is already getting its top choice. So although C would rather swap over to W, um, it cannot convince W to break from its current match. Um, does a stable perfect matching always exist? I, the answer to this question is certainly not obvious. Um, the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, and Gale and Shapley proved it by giving an algorithm. In the remainder of this lecture, I'll have time to describe to you the algorithm, and then on Monday we'll come back and analyze it. Okay, so this is called the proposal algorithm. Um, and it starts with everyone unmatched. Um, and then While there exists an unmatched employer, um, let's say X, X proposes to the highest ranked applicant it has not yet proposed to. Galen Shapley describes the entire market in terms of men and women getting married instead of applicants and employers uh, matching with each other. Um, I think that was to make the description more e colorful and evocative, but um, the whole description in terms of men and women really has the ring of 1960s American mores and rings a little more hollow in present day America, so I'm going to stick with employers and applicants. Um, But if you're wondering where the word proposes comes from, now you know. Uh, okay, so, so X proposes to the highest ranked applicant it has not yet proposed to. Um, okay, let's call that Y. If Y is matched, and prefers its current match to X, then uh, 
we make no change to the matching. Um, otherwise, x and y become matched to each other. Um, the previous partner of y, if any, becomes unmatched. And that process continues until there's no longer an unmatched employer. Um, you may wonder that, that okay. There, there are many things you may be wondering about this algorithm. Uh, some of the ones that come most readily to my mind are, does it terminate? It has a while loop. Uh, it's not obvious that this thing avoids infinite looping. Um, in particular, if there's an unmatched employer X who has run through their entire list and proposed to every applicant, um, what's going to happen when we start the while loop and choose that X? Um, there is no highest ranked applicant that it has not yet proposed to. Okay, so X doesn't make a proposal in this round. Nothing changes about the matching. We come to the end of the loop. We go back to the beginning and it's possible that we could iterate infinitely. Okay, so just proving that this algorithm terminates is going to take some thought to convince ourselves that that situation cannot happen. We can never end up with an unmatched employer who's run through their entire list of applicants um, and is yet unmatched. Uh, even if we can show that the algorithm terminates, how do we know that it'll output a perfect matching? How do we know that that perfect matching will be stable? Those are all things that we're going to address on Monday. How do we know that it's an efficient algorithm, that it runs in uh, not a humongous amount of time uh, to be done on Monday? Um, and finally, before I turn you loose, I want to point out one more uh, interesting thing about the specification of this algorithm, which will sort of be a recurring theme throughout 4820, um, which is this is actually not a complete specification of an algorithm. In particular, uh, if there's more than one unmatched employer at the start of the while loop, the pseudocode does not take a stance on how you're supposed to choose among the multiple possible x's that satisfy that conditional. Okay, so this is kind of a, a general property of how I am going to specify algorithms in this course and how you should feel free to specify them also. Um, it's more like an underspecified template for implementing an algorithm where if you were to take this block of pseudocode and transform it into code, anytime there's a kind of ambiguous arbitrary tie-breaking choice that has to be made, you would be responsible for writing the code that breaks the tie and makes a unique choice. And uh, whenever possible, I'm going to try to specify algorithms in sort of the most loosely specified way that still can be shown to work. And that leaves all of the implementation details of tie-breaking rules to the discretion of the implementer who can choose them in a way that's most appropriate for their application. And you should feel free to do so too. Um, okay, so that's one of the big differences between specifying an algorithm than specifying an actual block of code. Have a nice weekend. See you all Monday.